Tada, karibu back to Y254 TV. Just like that, we are back. Thank you for still staying with us here at Y in the Morning. This being on Wednesday and this particular segment being Empowerment Cafe. I hope by now to share that to move from Strength of a Woman to Empowerment Cafe. And this week's uh, Empowerment Cafe, I have an interesting lady. She is Agneta Alubarla. She is communication strategist, she runs a business, she is a philanthropist, she does a lot of things. But the good thing is that she is here to talk to us about it. So let's do what we do. Karibu sana, Agneta. Thank you, Grief. <laughs> You're well? Baridi yeah, mekupata well. wapi? Baridi menipata. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was asking myself, did it have to rain in this morning? Just wondering. It's not been raining. I love today. just <laughs> like that. One day, the one day we need to come to work at <laughs> four and five in the morning is the one day that it rains. Lili toka hivi nche ni kajambia. Can I go back and sleep? What I almost called you and told you, Grief. Today you're not doing it. It's raining. You look lovely. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you in person. So who is Agneta? So Agnet, uh, my, my name is Agneta Lubala and I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I tell stories for social impact. Um, so particularly in the areas of children, I love children and uh, women. And so I do that just to ensure that I, I try to put, uh, to give them a voice. And so that's what I do. And other than that, I'm also um, a social entrepreneur. I run a, a, an agency known as, a, known as a Brand Muzo. And brand Muzo, <coughs> Muzo basically means beautiful in Giriyama language. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I call the brand Brand Muzo. Because what we are trying to do is just to create very beautiful brands, not only for people, but also for corporate and uh, products. And so, f uh, and, and, and I'm also a uh, co-founder at an NGO known as um, mm -hmm. Thriving Child. It's a CBO. It also runs in Kilifi County. And that just links to what I say that I'm very passionate about children and and, and, and women in general. You seem to yeah. have a, you have a rich bio. I think that was the first thing I, I said mm. when I saw <coughs> you. But you seem to have a lot you're doing. How does your day look like before we even get to <laughs> talking about what you do? My day is usually normal, very normal. Looks like a day for any other person. Wake up in the morning, just look at my itinerary. What do I have to do today? But all, 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 all the time, whatever I do just revolves around just telling, my, telling stories. So. First of all, I want to look at, at the socials. What is happening within, within the, the, those spaces where we have children? What, what's happening in the children's spaces? What is happening in the women's spaces? And then with that, I, I'm just able to see what I need to, to plug in that day and just what I need to work around. So yeah, I, I basically just work uh, with the children. Maybe f sometimes I'm in Nairobi, sometimes in, in Kilifi, just on the ground to see what is happening on the ground. And rest, a lot is happening on the ground. So yeah. That's what my day looks like on a day and day, daily basis. Mm. Mm -hmm. So when did you realize you really wanted to tell stories? Since when I was a young girl. And uh, I, I think initially my passion was in advertising. Mm -hmm. Because from since when I was a little girl, I would, I would always walk in the supermarket and see products put on the shelves. I don't want to uh, imagine what went behind that product. Like sometimes you see an advert and you become so curious. Like, so what really went behind this thing so that now we have the whole product? Mm. So as, as I grew up, I became very interested in all that aspect. Just like if you're wearing that cloth, I, want to, I, I really get curious. Ah, this girl really, really looks beautiful in that dress. So what, what is behind it? And so as I grew up, I grew into the passion of that. Also, I really loved reading books. And my dad, I would say, is behind this because every time he'd go out, he'd come back with a book. And the passion of reading and just seeing how stories are brought out really pushed me into loving telling stories. So as I grew, I, I just became so passionate about that. Even in school, primary school, my English teacher was also very supportive in this because mm. he realized how much I loved telling stories. Unanazile kwandika composition, you're very creative, yeah. never been somewhere, but the way you are telling that story is really captivating. Paka mtu anona, eh, kwani uu mtu alikuwa ile place. But it's just because of um, a passion that really kept growing into me all through to, to campus and even up to now. Ah, yeah, just love telling stories. So you just tell general stories or you have a niche you've created? I used to tell general stories, mm -hmm. but then as I grew up in my career, I, I, I just narrowed down to telling stories for social impact. So mostly I tell stories in development communication. Ah. Then like stories about what is happening in, the, in, in, in marginalized places. How can we bring these stories to light so that these people can get the kind of help they need so that we can attract donors and such kind of things. Because every time I tell th that those kind of stories, I feel like I'm just trying to bring, the, bring these people to light and just at least give them a platform that they can also be able to be seen and heard. So ah. that's why for me, yeah, I always get to feel like I need to tell the stories. 
and perhaps also because I, mm -hmm. I have lived in Kilifi mm -hmm. and I have seen how much these people are not able to be understood because, you know, they are marginalized. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it just gives me pleasure when I tell stories about uh, social impact because when I see them in social spaces where if I had not told them, they would not be able to be seen in those spaces, I just feel like I've just contributed to the community. And so that's why I like telling social impact stories. Ah, amazing. Yeah. So how did you, how did you start Brand Muzo? So, when I finished campus, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I moved into the industry. And so what I, what, what, what I did is that I went into an agency. So I worked for a very long time. I worked with an agency. And so this agency exposed me to most of the clients who are clients from the, from the development industry. And so most of the time I would tell stories in the development industry. And so this really gave me an insight of what it is just to work with the marginalized people mostly. And so because of this, I thought to myself, I come from Cliffy County, like um, that is where I live. I'm married there. I also come from whatever Western Kenya, but you know Western Kenya is <laughs> is out yeah. there already. People know it. <laughs> exactly. So in Cliffy County, I realized that these people are marginalized, and no one is telling their story. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, first of all, this is a very beautiful community. Just look at all the, like how do I put? Look at their tradition, all the things that they have, their the tourists, the tourism that, they, that happens at that place, the ocean, all those things. But really, no one understands why those people are still the way they are. They're very, most of them are very, I would want to call them backwards, but let me just use that word so that it's raw. Mm. You know, sometimes when you put this information out in a raw way, there's a way it, it mm. just uh, it gives the real thing. So yeah, I realized that these people, most of the time, are really backwards and low, and no one is telling their story. You'll find that issues like teenage pregnancies, there are a lot of teenage pregnancies, a lot of people are not going to school. And you wonder why, yet civilization began at around those, those places. So I told myself, why not step in and tell these stories? And that's how Brand Muzo was born. Because I thought, um, if, I, if I use my agency to tell stories about these people, then I'm able to put them at least somewhere where they can be seen and they can get the help that they need. So as I said earlier, Brand Muzo, Muzo is a Giriyama word and it mm. means beautiful. So I thought, let me use a word that resonates to the people, but can also be translated in English to mean uh, that we are trying to create something beautiful out of these people. And so that is how I came up with Brand Muzo. Ah, amazing. Yeah. So how's the journey been? I would say the journey hasn't been easy, as uh -huh. always. But I love what I'm doing, and I love where it's going. Because um, it's been a journey of around four years, and you know entrepreneurship in Kenya is very hard. Mm -hmm. But for me, what I'm doing is what we call social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship is that you're doing this entrepreneurship, but for the little profits you get, you're giving it back to the community. So yeah, so far so good. We've moved, we've done... So for, 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 for the brand model, the social, imp the social aspect of it was that I decided uh, because of the statistic that we are having from Kilifi County where we are having mm -hmm. a lot of teenage pregnancies and a lot of these girls are not going back to school. So I decided what I do is my social impact would be because I'm a woman first and I have a lot of passion towards women and girls, I would then take my social impact to be, my social good to be giving back to these girls who, who are, vict uh, let me just call them victims, who are victims of... Um, of uh, teenage pregnancies. Mm. Some, sometimes people call them unwanted pregnancies, mm. but I wouldn't want to call them that. And so what I do is that I just try to talk to them. And as I said, I do build beautiful brands. So what I do is I do personal branding for them. I try to bring them out, speak to them, mm. uh, motivate them, and sometimes just link to them, them to opportunities that can be able to just give them a future once again. Because you know, mo most of the time when they are faced with this, they feel like their futures have already been done with. And so what I try to do is just bring them back at least to believing into themselves once again. And so this, pro this program is called Cocoon to Confidence. Like these girls are already in a certain cocoon. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is bring them out mm -hmm. and just give them the confidence they need to go on with their life. Ah. Yes. What are some of those uh, lessons you've picked along the way as a storyteller and mm -hmm. also with Brand Muzo? So I mean, what I picked along the way is the need for resilience. You know, most of the time you start something and you realize that it's just too much work. You can't continue doing it. Mm. And so every day you wake up in the morning and you tell, so why am I doing this? For what reason? Why don't I just look for a, work, for a job that I can just go to and get my paycheck at the end of the month? Mm. But then you realize if you do this, there's, a l there's so many other futures that you're trying to cut short because you see already these people are already done with. And so they... It just takes one person to speak to them and they realize, oh, I still have a life. So every day when I see that these girls are, 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 um, 
are realizing who they are, it keeps me going, it motivates me. And so that's why every day I wake up and, and, and I just realize I have to keep going, however much hard yeah, it is. Yeah, I know, <laughs> yes. right? So um, <laughs> one of the, I, th I thank you for bringing up the issue of um, teenage pregnancies because one of the major issues right now in Kenya mm -hmm. is um, the number of rising and planned yes. pregnancies, especially mm -hmm. among the teenage. Mm -hmm. How do you think we'd be able to curb that? I think it's just um, one, of, w one of the most important thing is policies. And for me, I feel like the education sector needs to bring in an aspect of um, trying to teach these children at a very young age. I know we have sex education in our curriculum, but it doesn't come out the way it's supposed to come out. We need to help these girls understand, not only the girls, because this is uh, something that cuts that's across because even in my work in Kilifi County I've realized it's not just the girls alone it's also the boys because you'll find it's a girl and a boy who did this mm -hmm. sometimes it's not even the older people so I think we need to bring this this uh, uh, learnings early into the curriculum so that by the time they're becoming uh, they're, they get to puberty they're able to understand that if we do this these are the results because sometimes they don't even know they know yes there's sex but then they do not know the impacts of it so I think we need to look at our educational policies and just try to change the curriculum so that we are able to talk to these, girl, to these children early enough in their, in their lives to understand the impact of what they are doing and what uh, it creates in the long run. And secondly, we also need to in, 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 inculcate it into the community. You find that the communities sometimes don't understand the impact of these things. And issues like GBV, you know, it creates, mm. you find that a, a girl has been raped by a dad, a girl has been raped by an uncle, and so most of the time you find that these people, the, the culprits, are not taken to book. And so we need to go back to the community and talk to them about the, 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 the importance of all these things so that they're able to know that it's not right for them to do this and it's not right for them to do that. Because you find a lot of times that it's the girl that, we, that is castigated, mm. and then the boy and the man and whoever else are let free. So we also need to bring these things to book. We need to bring them to the knowledge of the people in the community. And it's all through empowerment, actually. And it's not only for the girl, but for the entire community. Mm. Yes. Um, I, there's a question that we are asking today on our social media handles. Mm -hmm. I would want to um, engage you in it. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is an overemphasis of um, girl-child empowerment, especially given that we are getting into the month of world uh, where we celebrate the girl-child? Uh, in the month of March, do you think there is um, over empowerment of um, the girl child? I wouldn't say really it's over empowerment because mm -hmm. the people who are speaking about over empowerment, I think sometimes we've not gone back to the villages, back to the marginalized communities and just looked at what is in the ground. The girl is not even over empowered, neither is the boy. So I feel we st a lot of work still needs to go on. Because you go back to the villages, like for example, you go back to Kilifi County, you realize that the girl still does not understand her rights. She doesn't know what it takes to be a woman. She doesn't know what it takes to be, like, to have a voice of her own. She still has to follow rules that have been, she still has to follow what uh, the male figure in her life says. She still has to, like, uh, depend on the male for anything that she does. So I think there's still a lot that needs to go. To go, to go into this empowerment. Uh -huh. But at the same time, we don't need to leave the, the, the boy child behind. Mm -hmm. Because even in the, in the same communities, the same marginalized communities, we'll find even the boy child is still a little bit marginalized. So I think we need just to put in more fuel mm. and, and keep ah, going. Okay, amazing. Yes. So um, do you, what has been the greatest challenge for you dealing with um, the marginalized community, especially with Bran Muzo? So for me, the, 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 the greatest challenge that I've found is um, in, in still, I would say, in storytelling. You find mm -hmm. these stories are not being told. And even if, even if they're being told, the picture being painted is not as grim as the one on the ground. So I think we still, I would say that if more people would get into, back into the communities and just try to bring out those stories, and if we would at least have some kind of technologies that would help people to be able to tell those stories in a more like real way. I would say things like virtual reality. If we take them back to the villages and we are able to tell our stories in 3D in a way that even the person who needs to do these donations is able to see the real thing that is happening on the ground, then at least I think we'd be able to, to tell the stories in a more better way and we'll be able to impact the communities even much better. Are we doing enough? Not yet. <laughs> we're not doing enough, but we say we are trying, but we're not yet there. 
Yeah. Ah, amazing. So what would you suggest we do that we get, of course I know, probably we will never do enough, mm. but in your opinion, what do you think we could do to get towards the mark of enough? Yeah, so for me, I would throw it back to the government a little bit. <laughs> I feel like the government, especially uh -huh. the county government, mm. there's something that they're not doing. I feel like they're not putting the resources to the right places. For example, to give an example of, uh, I told you I'm also a co-founder at uh, a CBO known as um, Thriving Child. And so part of what we do is we look into schools and see how, are this, how, how is the education of these children? How is the um, wash? Like how is the wa how is the hygiene? What how how is the aspects to do with water, sanitation, and health, especially in schools and even in communities? And you'd find that these people lack all these basic needs. You see, like the basic needs we enjoy in Nairobi, you have water, you have food, you have good uh, hygiene. They are not there. You go to a school and you find a school has one toilet and uh, one thousand children, and then you find a school that does not even have um, what would they, does not even have water. And this child, even when she goes back to the community, there is no water. So what happens? Because you find now, they, you, when you go back to the county, you'll find they have a kitty for maybe early childhood education, which is supposed to give into these things. But that money doesn't get to the ground. So what I'm saying is, we, the, I think I'll throw it back to the government, where the government, because it's, it, it, it's the mandate of the government that every child gets um, good education, every child gets all their basic needs, because it's their right. I think it's pegged in the Bill of Rights. But then they're not getting this. So that's why I'm saying I think we need to push the government, especially the media would give you that challenge. You really need to bring these stories out <laughs> and invite the government to, this, to, to, to such, uh, such like talks so that they're able to respond to these questions. And then with that, we'll push them to be accountable. So that uh -huh. would be my suggestion. You introduced, uh, tr thank you. <laughs> you introduced thriving, thriving Child. That's where I was, I was going to actually. Mm. What, what's Thriving Child? So Thriving Child is a CBO. Mm. It, 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 it operates within Kilifi County and uh, it works in the child rights spaces. So other than child rights spaces, we also work with, um, you know, when you're working within, uh, you, you want to look at this child lives within a community. So within this community, who are the other people that, who are the other stakeholders that you can work with just to make sure this child thrives. So we work with the entire community and then mostly with focus on the women and uh, again, I'll bring in the issue of the teenage mothers because most of these children are products of teenage, teenage mothers, dads and fathers, both of them. So yeah, so we work in the child, child rights spaces and we look at their education, we want to see how is their education, we want to see um, how, how, how is their livelihoods like, Lively, human, are, are they working, are they, are they receiving the right human, are, mm -hmm. do they understand their, their rights as children? Do they understand what they need to, for them to survive in the communities as their thrived children? And for livelihoods, we want to see do the communities they live with, within uh, have the right resources for them to be able mm -hmm. to, like, uh, support these children to thrive. So yeah, that's those, those are the three pathways that we work with. Ah, with amazing, thrive. amazing. Yes. Do you um, now that you work with children, and then you also work with uh, teenage girls, and of course, by extension, mm -hmm. uh, boys? One of the things that has been raising um, an emerging concern among the young people particularly the transition between teenage to mm -hmm. young adulthood is identity crisis mm -hmm. how what has been your experience with young people and identity crisis so i would say grace back in the communities mm -hmm. identity crisis identity crisis is really not a big problem mm -hmm. because you see they already have their norms within them but mm -hmm. when you start uh, exposing these children because of even technology, you find there are some of them who are a bit b exposed. So this I'm talking to those, I'm talking about those ones who at least have seen mm -hmm. the light. But when you go back deep into the villages, most of these girls don't, don't have that issue of uh, identity. Like they know this is what I am, this is a, I'm a woman. I'm, because they are taught by their grandmothers, like you're a woman, this is what a woman does. And this is how a woman is supposed to behave. So they do not have those issues until when they are now brought into light and now they realize oh so this is, has been happening in the spaces so that's why now um, uh, we find that most of them when they're exposed to internet or technology now they start realizing oh i need to do this so that i look like these people so this is how a woman should look like and so now that's where the problem comes in and that's why i said now that's why we come in with a personal branding training for mm -hmm. most of them and so we just help them to realize that as much as you come from this village and as much as you do not have this this that is similar to that other girl in the city you are still enough be you be mm -hmm. authentically you 
do you? Because you have something within you in it <laughs> that will help you just to grow up <laughs> and be a woman. That's <laughs> You've shared because that Nikakumbuka story, a kienyeji. Uh-huh. You remember the... Yeah, I could say like Because now at the moment you start living yes. someone else's life, upon the unanza kwa na your identity crisis. Because now you want to be someone else who you are not. So you struggle. And within that struggling, then you lose yourself. And that's yeah. why you've been seeing girls killing themselves because they're not what they want to be. Mm. And so we really train them, we tell them, as much as you are seeing Grace looking that beautiful, mm -hmm. that is Grace. That is how she is. You do not have to be Grace. You are Kazo, <laughs> stay as Kazo. <laughs> Kazo is also yeah, a yeah, yeah. beautiful. So just stay you. Mm -hmm. And within you, there's something that God has placed within you that will make you great. So work on that thing. So we just help them to try and realize what is this thing within me that will make me propel into the life that I want to be without necessarily living the life of someone else. Mm. Yeah. What do you wish someone would have told you uh, when you started storytelling as opposed to now? Like what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started? That storytelling is just a craft. It's mm. a craft. You really don't need to have all those papers. Or okay, it's good to have them. But it's something that you need. You don't need to follow protocol to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Tell it as it is. That is how it will sell. That is how it will it it, it will it will create an uh, impact. That is how it will um, uh, impact to emotion. Because if you try to follow all the protocol, somewhere along the way, it will not it will not appeal to emotion. Yeah. Because you know the the most important aspect of a story is is it appealing to emotion? Like if I'm telling you a story, nataka nione emotion zako ziki. Mm. But the moment you start following protocol, the moment you start uh, doubting yourself, the moment you start saying, wa, sasa hii story ni kiandika si jaribu ni danganya kidogo. Mm. The moment you bring in that danganya ring, do your story na lose meaning. Mm. So just be real with your storytelling. That is something I wish someone told me when I started telling stories. Because most of the time I would struggle, I would write a story and then read the script and I'm like, no, this story is not, it's not wha how it's supposed to be. Mm. But you know, it's not a matter of how it's supposed to be. It's a matter of what is the real story because you are telling that story to create to, cre to, to at least make someone do an action so if you want to change the narrative then the person will not be able to understand the real aspect that you're trying to bring out mm -hmm. and so they will not give you the help that you want or you not get the impact that you want or you not get the results that you want you think uh, yeah so, I need to to so that you be real uh. and let the story just come out the way it's supposed to come out that is something i wish i, I knew Especially when I was working in agencies, I struggled. I struggled. <laughs> you're trying to yeah, impress, you're trying to find yes. the words, and you're trying to fill up. I want big words. I want, you know, <laughs> I want it to flow. Like, at you know, I'm introduction, but he, haina, ina it on the deal. Yeah. Haina kick us, job out. So you struggle, like, what you've been taught in class, like, and then I'm like, oh. So even now, uh, okay, sometimes I teach, <laughs> a lecturer. So I try to tell my students, please, Go on a short road. Let the story flow. All right. If it flows, uta wana tui kwa naizo vitu. Eh. Zita kuza hizo headline, sub headline. But let the story flow the way it's supposed to. Just open up your mind and let it flow. Okay. Mm. What will you want to tell a girl this morning? Or rather a young person this morning listening or rather watching you. And they just want some, a word to propel them. Be, just be you. Be you and let you. Amazing. Yes. Thank because you so the moment you're just yourself, mm -hmm. I assure you things will flow. But the moment you want to live the life of another person, mm -hmm. the moment you want to make people like you by force, it's not going to happen. Amazing. Yeah. But if you're just yourself, authentically, you just. I'm telling you, Grace, it, it, it just creates a lot of open doors like you. People know this is Grace. We don't have to like. Go deep to understand her because if we just see her, we know uh, she's grace, she likes smiling, she's you know, you don't have to force yourself to be someone who you're not. Be yourself, and that will just work out. Amazing. I'm being told our time is out, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. We really, I really appreciate you, really okay. appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you for your time. Yeah, and maybe if someone wants to reach out to yes, that's <laughs> what I actually wanted to tell you. Now, the last thing finally, uh, use the camera, let us know where we can find you. Yeah, so for both, if, if you want to create a brand that is beautiful, if you want to create a brand that will give impact to your products, your personal brand, to, 
to, to, to your corporate brand, please reach out to Brand Muzo. We are at www.brandmuzo.com. On our socials, we are on Twitter on, or X. We are on X at brand, brand underscore Muzo. We are on highly on LinkedIn at Brand Muzo. For Thriving Child, we are looking for collaborations to be able to impact the children of Kilifi County. So please li reach us at Thriving Child CBO. Um, on, on, on our website and uh, on our socials on LinkedIn, reach us at Thriving Child CBO. We'd really like to collaborate with you and just bring out, help children thrive in this community. Thank you so much. All right, Agneta, thank you for your time. We really appreciate you. Thank you. That was Agneta talking to us about what she's doing with the amazing uh, teenagers of Kilifi. Not just the teenagers, she's doing a whole lot in the philanthropy world, in the, in the, community-based organization and with her brand that is Brand Mood. So I hope this morning you have been empowered. We are taking a short break, but I can see Val has something juicy coming up for you right next.